Well, initially there was, there was uh, plenty of inquiries from other institutions around the country, like barracks and jails and workhouses and other asylums around the country that held Wexford patients at the time who were mentally ill and uh, wanted the, the inspectors in, in, in the Department of Asylums at, at Dublin Castle to set up one in, in the County Wexford. And an order was made in 1860 that they'd build one in, in Wexford and Enniscorthy was chosen. In those days, most all the asylums and, and most of the, the institutions were built on a prime site, so Enniscorthy was chosen. It's just about 40 yards from the Wexford Road. Now, we heard the story before we were growing up in the town about the plans being mixed up and this hospital was supposed to be built in India. Is there any truth to those No, nah, it was a lot of nonsense. There was a, a guy in, in Pretoria who used to uh, design buildings, and uh, the one here was something like that, so they got the idea that that the, building, the plans were mixed up and one came here and the other one went to India, but there was no truth in it. Right. Now, when the hospital was opened up itself, it was totally self sufficient its own fruit and veg and stuff like this. That's quite true. Well, it had to look after itself because it, it was built, there was a big wall built around it. And uh, in those days, uh, people, those people wouldn't be allowed to walk around the streets of Enniscorthy or County Wexford. So everybody who, who suffered from mental illness in those days, they called them imbeciles and idiots and lunatics. But they were all housed in, in, in workhouse and everywhere else. But when the, the doors opened, they all came here. So as soon as they improved with, 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 with uh, attention, they were sent to St. John's or sent home. Did they come in here, were they here for the rest of their lives? No, or they... not necessarily. Uh, going through the books, you'll find that uh, certain people had a readmission down through the years. Maybe once, twice, three times, even five, six times. In and out to all times? In and out, yeah. Now you worked here for a number of years. I was here for 44 and a half years. Yeah, and you must have grown very attached to the business, haven't you? Ah, very attached to it, yeah. It was, it was my place to work for that amount of time, and that you can't forget. And I worked with a lot of kind, good people, both male and female, and all staffs. Right. Now, by all staffs, I mean even the maintenance staff and the farm staff, and kitchen staff, domestics on the wards, doctors. They were all good, and even the office staffs. In your time here, did you see much of a change in the treatment for people with mental illness? Oh, yeah, there was big changes down through the years. Uh, shortly before my time, uh, they, they found, they came upon antidepressants and, and, and tranquilizers as treating malaria. And they found that they had effect on, on depressed people and, and people who were suffering from, from uh, melancholia. Treatment for malaria? Yeah. And not work for depression? Not work for depression. Like people with, with malaria suffer from depression, and when they introduced the, the drugs to them, the depression lifted. Right. So they decided to use it on, on the psychiatric patients. Right. Now, the people who were here who were um, into arts and crafts, was, was there not much activities for the patients? Or ah, there was more of this. That in, in the olden days, there wasn't that much. You had a farm and you had the workrooms and that sort of thing, and you had the walking yards. Uh, but in latter years, they, they had the therapies and, and uh, the workrooms where they did sewn and needlework and all that sort of stuff and, and became. Art was introduced in modern times, and you know, people got people got plenty of activity. There was plenty of activity for me. So there was a lot of people used to say, and I remember him. I remember Pat McGill actually was one of them. He said, "When I leave this place, I'll write a book on it." But uh, a lot of these people went and never wrote a book, whether they had a the time or not. I don't know, but they just didn't do it. Well, I had a time, and I started a few years ago compiling records and anything that I could find. And when it closed, when it closed the stores for admissions last February, I decided this was the time to publish the book. So I published the book. So the time for Christmas? Yeah, out now on the 6th of December. All right. And uh, like, is there any stories you can tell us about the place while you're here? I mean, any oh, characters I, in the place? I could tell you many, many, many stories. One particular story that I love telling is a lady on night duty one night, she rang me. It was about quarter to one. And she said, and she was in a, in a hard state. So I got someone to relieve me, and I went over to her, and I said, what's wrong with you? Oh, God, she said, this place is haunted. Why, I said to her, what did you see? Come over here, and I looked out the window, and floating in the moonlight was a white sheet, what appeared to be a white sheet. And I said, there's only a white, white bit of paper or something going by. And she said, no, watch, and it came back. So I decided to go and investigate, and there was a lad walking, who had been on duty, was walking a greyhound 
<laughs> between the time he'd come walk about 40 yards and he'd come back again. <laughs> Frightened the dim in there, I know. Was she a patient staff member? Oh, she was a staff member of <laughs> One o'clock in the morning. In the morning. But uh, I left Hearty when I saw that. I didn't know what I was going to meet or what, what was down there, but I knew there was something up, whatever it was. But uh, ah, there was queer things and queer rumours about the place and how Dr. Jeffs was supposed to have been seen many times out at the front. And women, of course, see me. you could see a black shadow and they'd make yeah. sure that it was a ghost or something. But I was for a lot of night. I was here, I never saw I was here day and night, I never saw any. <laughs> St. Gertrude's Ward, we're in one of the dormitories. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit what, what was life like in these rooms? Uh, life was okay in these rooms. I mean, you had you had uh, beds down along and screens around each bed. And uh, yeah, good nursing staff looked after them all their lives here. There was no such thing as a mixed ward up here. Uh, they did have a mixed ward in the admissions one time, but they had to, had to revert back to male and female again, to what just doesn't work. At least uh, when the hospital was built, the one side on the left-hand side of the tower was uh, male, and the one on the right-hand side was female, and that's the way it always remained. No mixing, no mixing at all. No in dining halls, they mix a small bit, but well, out mixing, uh, yeah, only, only in latter years. But there would be real good patients. Right. And what was the routine here? What time was bed? What time was breakfast? What time well, when you got up in the morning, shortly after eight o'clock, and washed yourself, and those who weren't able to wash themselves were washed and dressed. And then you had breakfast around nine o'clock. And uh, some of them went to mass around half nine, half, or sorry, half eight. But we changed that in latter years. Mass then became at 10 o'clock the way all people could be wheeled up to mass and that. So like every other community, thing, things change and rules change. But it was great. I mean, your own, your own church here? We were all in church on the, on the middle block. And were patients allowed to walk around the grounds? Oh, yeah. Pa patients had, had uh, ground parole and town parole. The patients on, on ground parole could only walk within the walls at the hospital, but people who had town, patrol, town parole could walk out to town and get a newspaper or buy cigarettes or whatever in town. So <laughs> or, or visit relatives. And they had a breakfast, they had to mass, what would they do with the rest of their time in the day? Well, sure. They went down to the, to the workrooms or down the, the dart down in the workrooms and they went out on the land picking potatoes and all that sort of stuff. There was needlework for the women as well and all that. I mean, it was, it was kept, busy, kept, kept busy all the time. You had patients with the carpenter, patients with the ma mason. All, all the workmen in the place had a, had a, a, a pet patient going around with them. And <laughs> yeah, well, the patient who would know something about carpentry or masonry or whatever they were doing or painting or whatever, yeah. you know, and it, it worked. Kept them active. Kept them active all. Kept their minds active all day.
about it since Eddins. Can you tell us a bit about the history of this? How many people are here? Or is there yeah, the, records? the history of the, of the graveyard is easy enough to, to understand. It was, it was uh, came to being in 1874 with word from the uh, inspectors of the Lunatic Asylums in, in, in Dublin Castle and they decided that we should have a, a, a graveyard here and they picked a little plot of ground here and as you can see it's not a big graveyard but fancy size enough for a hospital. Yeah. And they've been buried here like their own family couldn't take care of them? Or couldn't that's afford. quite true, that's quite true. I actually saw letters, a couple of letters from uh, one actually from a sister who couldn't afford to bury her brother. She, she was in poor circumstances and would, be, would the hospital bury him here. And uh, it happened in a good few instances, I'd say. And there's no actual record of how many people are buried here? There's no actual record of how many people are buried here. I have a record of a few that I, that I found in reading the books. A couple of dozen, I'd say, at most. There's one famous story about a girl or a woman. Ah, yeah, the rest of the spirit, Rose Quinn. Yeah, I was sent for one day and asked to find Rose Quinn and I found her. And uh, they wrote a great book about her and did, did a, a, a television article about her. And uh, it, it was actually very well written and uh, uh, good good read. And there, is a, there is a story behind it. Can you tell us a bit about the story? The story behind it was that uh, poor old Rose was forced to marry uh, this gentleman down in her, in her area and uh, she didn't want to live with him. And uh, she was uh, admitted to uh, the New Ross workhouse. And apparently she became very unmanageable there and she was admitted, transferred up here and admitted to St. Sennens. She died within a couple of months after being admitted here. But there is a record that her husband did visit her when she, when she was here. So um, I don't know what the true fact of the story is, but uh, the girl wasn't wasn't well mentally anyhow, but right, that, that's only my own opinion. Yeah. So we don't know where she's buried, but we have our uh, monument to her here, and to the people who are buried in it. Oh, there's a pattern here every year now, yeah. I mean, there's a couple of gardens used to always run the pattern here, Francis Murray and, uh, and Redmond. They used to always do the graveyard here with flowers and that, and the land store that gets the boys to clean up the briars and the trees and all around it. And the big Nice for it. Well you can see it's well looked after, yeah. even at the minute, you know, it's clean and tight. The last person, I believe, I was informed by, by one of the older nurses a few years back that uh, the last person buried here was in the 1940s and he was a knight of the road with no family. A knight of the road? Yeah. That means he was a wanderer around homes, you know, all fixed the board. Nice way of putting it. Nice way of putting it. A knight of the road, yeah. In the 40s, that recent story. That's in the 40s, yeah. Well, I, I haven't a clue what I want to do with it, Jim. Uh, what I do know is that there's a lot of offices for different organisations in the health board set up here now at the minute, and I presume that they're going to continue here, but if they do, they may do something with the roof because the, roof's, the roof is leaking in part in places. But I haven't a clue what I want to do with it. An old shame to see a bit like this. Oh, it'd be a crying shame to see it go. Like it's in very good order at the minute, and, and it would make a make a lovely school or a college or that. Yeah. But uh, it's not my job to, to dwell on those things. Yeah. People wouldn't listen to me anyhow. It's very strange that a home that was <coughs> a place that was a home for some people. For so oh long. yeah, home for so many people for so long. I mean, it's it, it, it's it's a disgrace in my book. And it is part of the history of the town. Part of the history of the town and the employment of the town and brought money into the town. And I mean, it was it was brilliant, and it worked. And a lot of people are going to miss it.